on today's story beat. There is no greater special effect in cinema than the human eye when the mind behind it is being changed. So if you can really, you know, connect with like what you're looking at and really get it through in your eyes that you're like processing this information and thinking about, you know, you're changing your mind or you're thinking of what to say, stuff is going to be going on in those eyes and that's like such an amazing, you know, rather than doing like all this big, you know, like, I don't know, big sort of uh, acting, you know, just really that type of thing is, is really interesting to watch. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Callum Woodhouse, is a brilliant stage and screen actor originally from Durham, England. You may recognize Callum from playing Leslie Durrell in ITV's much-loved series, The Durrells. He's also starred as Tristan Farnan in the Masterpiece TV adaptation of All Creatures Great and Small, and as James Marsden in Series 6 and 8 of ITV's beloved British comedy drama Cold Feet, starring alongside James Nesbitt, Faye Ripley, Robert Bathurst, Hermione Norris, and John Thompson. He also played Will Taylor in Christopher Hatton's excellent Edgar Allan Poe feature, Raven's Hollow. Chris Hatton has been a guest on this podcast, as has Callum's exceptional co-star, Melanie Zanetti. Callum trained at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. On stage, he has appeared at the Hampstead Theatre in Ryan Craig's Filthy Business, which was directed by Edward Hall. The play also starred Sarah Kesselman, Ashley Martin Davis, Louis Hillier, Dorian Luff, and Callie Cook. Filthy Business opened to rave reviews with Callum's performance being critically hailed as sharply defined in The Guardian, glinting promise in The Telegraph, and a fine performance in The Financial Times. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a truly great pleasure for me to have the great, not small, actor Callum Woodhouse join me today. Callum, welcome to Storybeat. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. What an incredible introduction. Thank you for that. Well, it's my great pleasure to have you here, believe me. So... Let's go back in time just a little bit and look at your history. You've been at the acting game for a little bit. You're not all that old, but you're, you've been at it for a while. So I'm wondering at what age did the bug first bite you to be a performer, to be an actor? Do you know, I've sort of been doing it for as long as I can remember. I've been going to sort of theater groups, you know, getting my mum and dad to sort of get themselves out of bed early Saturday mornings and drive me to, you know, some local theater group. For as pretty much as long as I can remember. Um, I actually don't, I personally don't have a memory of this, but my mum assures me that when I was two years old, she took me to the cinema to see Babe Pig in the City, Babe 2. <laughs> and at the end of the film, apparently, I, point, I turned to her and I said, that's what I want to do. So apparently Babe 2 was just the start of um, <laughs> my dreams to, to eventually become an actor, apparently, according to my mother. Who would ever guess Babe 2 would do it? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So for you, acting is kind of a calling then, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I struggled at school in terms of like, you know, academic um, sort of, t like, you know, those typical sort of subjects. Um, and acting was just sort of always something that I actually felt like I was good at. And, you know, it's like, uh, it's, 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 it's not a nice thing to sort of always be like down on the dumps, you know, in the bottom sets for things when your friends are in the top sets. And so to actually have one sort of subject and one thing that I felt like like not only I was good at but I knew a lot about and things like that it was like yeah it sort of was my like a little sort of safe haven type of type of thing yeah so aside from babe two who did you then start to look at who did you admire and go I want to have a career I want to act like that person mm -hmm. who, who did you look at and who are your influences oh man there's been so many over the years you know growing up um I think like it, much younger, it was always, it was all the typical ones. It was all the Marlon Brando's and it was people like that. And then I remember there was a TV, it was sort of three TV movies that came out um, while I was still in secondary school on channel four called the Red Riding Trilogy. And it had people like Sean Bean and Andrew Garfield and Peter Mullen, uh, Paddy Considine. 
And it was one of the first things that I had seen that was sort of so cinematic and incredible and sort of had that like kind of almost Hollywood feel to it. But all of the accents in the show were my accents. It was all Northern men sort of doing these like sort of gritty Northern performances. And I sort of remember seeing it and being like, oh, wow. So maybe someone like me can be in that world then. And that was a big inspiration to me. So I, I remember bumping into Andrew Garfield once in a, in a Byron burger and just sort of, and this was like, this was like two weeks before I graduated Lambda as well. I went over to him. I just said, you know, your performance and I mean, he's d done some incredible performances over the years, Andrew Garfield, but there was something about that Red Riding one for me, which is always, it just, it just means a lot to me, that performance, because it was one of the first times I'd seen a Northern voice in like a leading role. So yeah, definitely, definitely things like that. And then later on, it would obviously like I went through my, you know, I went through quite a long uh, Tom Hardy phase, as I'm sure every young <laughs> male actor has done. You, you you gain new sort of icons like the more you learn about film and the more you watch film. So Gary Oldman obviously came into play. Philip Seymour Hoffman obviously came into play. Like all of these like you know incredible character actors who you sort of aspire to sort of do even half as good a performances. Were you doing plays while you were in school as a kid? Yeah, so we, yeah, I was at a theatre group um, with some of my friends, and we we put on a lot of shows um, there, a lot of, like plays, sort of musicals, things like that. So like, and that was never really what I wanted to be doing in terms of like doing sort of singing and dancing numbers. But to go to the school, you had to do those if you also wanted to do the plays. And actually, like, I'm so glad that was the case because you know, while it wasn't necessarily my like my first sort of passion, I'm so glad I sort of did all that and I you know, like sort of in my system now I sort of have a sort of wider understanding of all of them rather than just being like players acting and that's that's it I've got a bit more of an understanding of everything now and so you believe yeah. schooling is a good thing for actors I think so personally yeah um I also think everyone's different you know I like the theater group I went to and and the drama classes I had at school were re really really good but also you know, I would think like the north of England, you know, it's not like the centre of LA or the centre of London, you know, it's quite, it's quite far removed. So for me personally, I still feel like I needed to go to drama school. I was very clueless about lots of things, the industry definitely being one of them. I had no clue, you know, as well as sort of wanting to learn all these techniques and learn more about my craft and everything. It, there was also an element of drama school where it was like, this is my ticket to to the industry. I don't think I can just go straight into the industry. I think I need to do drama school where you, you then at the end have a showing and agents come and see you and then pick you up from that rather than I didn't think I had it in me to just get an agent like that at 18. I think I needed to, yeah. So you had a certain, I think a lot of artists do, a certain amount of uncertainty about whether you were even going to be able to be in the business. So you um, needed the training is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. I think there was a lot of uncertainty, but then there was also a sort of blueprint in my head, if that makes sense, of like sort of how I imagined it going. But obviously, you know, the best laid plans, you know, type of thing. Of my, has, it, you know. has it gone in any way like the blueprint? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got into like dream drama school first year of auditioning went with uh signed with an agency that was like my dream agency when I started to learn about all the different agents in London then I worked with um I worked like my first show was you know I made lifelong friends filmed out in Corfu like paradise like yeah I think I think I think I've stuck to the blueprint for a good, a good couple of years well honest. I'm glad to hear you say that because I would say <laughs> looking at your career yeah. which is not a lengthy career but it's a very healthy one uh, hmm. Yeah, you have had a really good run up till now, and I assume you're going to continue to have a great run. When you were at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, what do you think you learned there? Any particular things that you learned or important things that you know will carry you through the rest of your career? Oh, God, man, there's a lot. Um, obviously, goes without saying, you know, a, a broader, larger understanding of like text and like, I'm not even talking about sort of forensically like analyzing, I'm just sort of talking about reading and learning about new playwrights and learning about the and learning about the royal court and the type of things they put on and the type of things national theatre put on like all of that you know you soak you immerse yourself in it and that's just invaluable and then on top of that I think going to drama school I was terrified of Shakespeare I'd gone to a one of the these theatre groups I'd gone to whilst it was amazing they had their sort of opinions on what Shakespeare sort of was and I think well I don't I sort of know looking back now that their opinions were completely wrong it was like 
you know, if you're going to do Shakespeare, it has to be performed in an RP accent, posh British accent. Otherwise, it's wrong. You have to do it this way. You have to do it that way. And I was like, I can't do this, and I can't do this, and it's just too much. Tell the to listeners who don't know what RP, what does that mean? Like what, the, like how they speak in the crown on Netflix type of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, that type of, the sort of posh English. You know, the, 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 their opinion, like that this group, that this uh, theatre group was that, yeah, if, if you're not doing Shakespeare in that accent, then you're doing it wrong. So I just sort of had this complete aversion to it and then came to Lambda and all the teachers were like, no, no, do it in your accent. It's way better in your accent. And just sort of opened that up to me like so much. And like I found this deeper um, appreciation for it. The main things I think for me that is like I, I like I just feel like I have it in my body now, and I know it'll serve me for the rest of like my career. Is just a lot of their voice work and a lot of their breath work. You know, I think I like breathe into my stomach now, and I just don't even think I'm doing it because for just three years that was drilled into into me. You know, you breathe into your stomach, not your chest. And so now, like, it's like the breath capacity is just like, I don't even think about it. And it's and, it, and, it, and it's just there because it certainly wasn't like that before, before I went to drama school. Does not breathing properly affect your physical performance as well? I think so. Yeah, definitely. And especially on stage, you know, if you're in, you know, if you're trying to fill a big room, you know, we one of the things we did, I think it was towards the end of second year, a lot of the drama schools in London do it. Um, you sort of do like a school trip almost to uh, the National Theatre, the uh, Olivia stage, which is the huge sort of amphitheatre style stage and in the um, in the National, it's a huge, huge auditorium. And you basically get up on stage and your teacher puts people around in every sort of spot in the in, in the auditorium and, say, and they say, do your monologue. And if at any point someone can't hear you, they're allowed to stop you. Um, wow. And on, there wasn't a lot of stuff at Lambda where I was like top of the class, top of the class, top of the class. There really wasn't. But on that day, I uh, my my loud, booming Northern voice, no, not, a <laughs> single person, not a single person stopped me. They heard every word. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, school is a very funny thing. Sometimes the really hot students in school don't have great careers and sometimes the ones you don't think are going to be so hot kind of have brilliant careers yeah yeah so school is a funny thing about that you've done obviously a bunch of theater as well as before the camera do you have a preference for one or the other i don't think i do no um i did a lot obviously mainly the main theater i've done has been at lambda um i did the one filthy business like that, that you mentioned which was incredible one of my favorite favorite like moments of my career absolutely but yeah, I don't know if I do. I don't know if I do prefer one or the other. I think there's definitely, like, you know, with theatre, you're basically in character for two and a half hours and you don't get to come out of it. But I think cinema was where I fell in love with acting and the, the craft itself, you know, cinematic sort of that whole spectacle. So I, I ask this question of lots of actors who do both. Mm -hmm. And I'm always curious about what they say. For you, aside from the fact that the camera makes it more intimate, that you mm -hmm. bring the performance down because you don't want to be trying to reach the last row of the theater, what are the differences for you between those two, between stage and working on camera? How do you approach them differently? Well, I think because with stage, you know, you as I said, like you can you can sort of be in character for two and a half hours. So there's not so if you're sort of going on for a scene where you know I'm I'm coming in because you've just like murdered my dog or whatever. Uh, like we might we might have just done that scene. So I don't need to then backstage go, okay, like, how am I going to, okay, I need to get myself into this sort of emotional state because we've just done that scene so I can just come straight from it. Whereas in film, you know, that scene, we could be shooting, the scene that just happened before, we could be shooting two weeks in the future because of the way that locations are managed. So you've just got to figure out a way of getting there without having lived that type of thing. Which And which, what do you do? Yeah. How do you do it? I just try and like liken it to sort of something that's maybe happened in my life, try and find the similarities or like, that's obviously a, a wild example where you just try and, yeah, you just try and like humanize it within your body. But like, it's almost, it's almost more fun in a way, sort of having to kind of invent that there and then. Um, but as I said, with theater, you know, you get to live the whole thing and that's incredible. And you come off at the end and you're like, wow, like, I don't know, I don't know where I've just been for the last two and a half hours. Um, <laughs> whereas, whereas with TV, you've got to you've got to try and f find it yourself and invent it yourself. And I just love both aspects of that, really. And so you expect, I assume, to do both for the rest of your life. I, I would love to, yeah, if I'm lucky enough. 
up to. Yeah, absolutely. I have a funny feeling you'll be able to to call your shot as you will. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do to regularly develop your acting chops? Do you perform at home? Do you memorize things? What do you do? Lots of watching things, lots of watching things on Netflix, lots of watching independent films from, you know, different countries, you know, all aspects of cinema. Um, books in, as well as another one, like I, I think I think for a couple of years I fell out of reading books for a while and I was just watching, watching, watching stuff and I think now I'm trying to ha find like a sort of healthy medium of like everything. And then the other thing is, you know, the amount of self-tapes that come through for actors nowadays, you sort of... I mean, if they, if they ever sort of dried up, I would absolutely 100% love to go to like acting classes and things like that. Like that would be incredible. But the sort of rate that the self tapes are coming in, um, that, that like as they do, you sort of constantly feel like you're working and you constantly feel like you're like owning your craft, trying out all these new different characters. The other thing I've I've actually um, discovered recently is uh, a group of my friends from drama school. We all uh, now play Dungeons and Dragons together, which, you know, you can act as little or as much as you want. And so maybe at the start of the evening where we've had like one beer, we're not we're not we're not acting too much. And then maybe two or three beers later, we're sort of maybe giving it a little bit more <laughs> to each other. It's a very safe space. So we can all be silly and act together. So, yeah, that's a, that's another good one. Actually, it's quite a sort of performancey kind of thing. So it's Dungeons and Dragons and beer. Yes, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. and I bought. I actually have two cans in the fridge of um, a beer that has been named after Dungeons and Dragons. It's called Dungeons and Flagons, and I'm going. To, <laughs> I'm going to surprise all my friends with these two cans. I was like, I've got two cans that go with our Dungeons and Dragons game. Oh, fantastic, fantastic! So, going back to the auditioning process, you used the term self tapes. For mm. the listeners who don't know, self tapes are you putting yourself on some kind of a recording device, whether it's your phone or a camera or whatever, uh, yeah. so that casting people can see you doing a, a role or auditioning for it. What is your philosophy toward auditioning? How do you think about auditioning as a process? It's it's interesting because sometimes you know you don't get huge amounts of turnaround to get to get them done, and. If I'm being completely honest, there has been a few self tapes I've sent off in my time that have ended up sort of just being a bit of a memory test and haven't ended up being, I haven't felt like I've done sort of required amount of sort of character work. And it's sort of just been about like, oh, I managed to learn all these lines in the time that they gave me, which, you know, I'm sort of starting to think less and less that that's what it should be about. It should be more, it should, it should be more the other way. Like, look, I've created this character, but I didn't learn the lines rather than I've learned these perfectly, but I don't know who I'm playing type of thing. I've sort of, I think it's, I think it's better to actually switch that. But in terms of like, you know, when you do, when you do have a good amount of time and when you really connect with the script, like, I don't know. I don't know. I always used to worry that this, when I was at drama school, I used to worry that this sounded quite lazy, but I'm not the type of person who likes to sort of mark my script up and write, you know, on this line, like this sort of action and emotion and things like this. I just like to sort of be informed by what I'm feeling there and then, which, you know, nine times out of 10 could be completely wrong because it could be how I'm feeling could be wrong for the script. But, you know, and that one time out of 10 where it sort of works perfectly, like it's just so much more magic and electric than s something that's sort of prescribed. And and like, you know, there's, there's actors that work that way and are incredible. I'm just saying for me, I, I like to sort of be informed by like, like the person who's speaking to me, how they said that line informs how I'll say my next rather than the thing that I wrote on the script two weeks ago when I got it type of thing. You're talking about being in the moment and reacting yeah, to what's coming present. at you. And listening, yeah, I've been watching like um, the fourth season of Succession at the minute, and I mean the entire cast are incredible. But one one of the things I noticed is Jeremy Strong, who pre who plays Kendall. Like, if you watch him in scenes where someone else is speaking, like he is just listening to every word that is being said, and you can literally see in his face that he's taking this information in and processing it. And I think that's something that I sort of strive for. Well, that's sort of, uh, as I understand it, that's everything for an actor is it's what's happening with the other characters, not what's happening with you. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's what you're focusing on. And if you don't have that to bounce off of, if, for example, in a monologue or in an audition where it's just you, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge to develop that character. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I've always, I've always thought a very big challenge for me that I would, that I would love to tackle someday is like a, is like a one man player. Sure. 
Well, I don't know. I don't know how I would do that. Like, yeah, you're up on a tightrope with no net. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's no one to save you if you've gone up on a line. That's for <laughs> <Exactly>. sure. <laughs> so when you look at parts that uh, you're thinking about playing or you're auditioning for, sometimes in a, an actor's career, and I assume this is for you as well, you don't really have a choice. In other words, that is to say, they've said, "Do you? We would like you to play this part. Would you like to play it?" And that's after you've gone through a process of auditioning. But mm. what for you makes a role attractive? Have you ever turned anything down because it wasn't attractive or what brings you to a part? What is it you're looking for that makes you think this is for me? Yeah. The writing is always something like I always think whenever, whenever you get a half going back to like the self tape audition thing, like whenever I'm learning these scenes, if the lines are going in incredibly easy and I'm managing to memorize them really easily, that's a big sign for me that I'm really connecting to this work and to this character. When it's a bit of a struggle to learn the lines, it's like, well, maybe, you know, I wonder why I can't learn this so well. So that's always a big one, you know, just seeing how it's written and seeing, you know, how it reads and the amount of times I've sort of read a script, um, all creatures, all creatures was one actually, cause I, when I went up for that part, I didn't really know about the original series from the 80s. I'd heard of the books, um, but went for the audition, loved loved the episodes that they gave me. Uh, Tristan was only, the, I, I got given the first two and Tristan was only in the second. Yeah, I just loved, I just loved reading him, um, but didn't really know anything else about that and didn't want to research anything really because I was like, well, if I don't get it, then I'll just be even more devastated. And then when I got it, I was like, okay, well, I'm not gonna watch the show because that might I might end up being sort of informed slightly by Peter Davison's uh, portrayal, the original Tristan. So I was like, I'm going to go and read the books. And I remember reading the books. Um, I was on holiday at the time, and I was like, on, like reading these books like by the pool, and I was just like laughing out, like sort of like drawing stares from people around the pool because of how much I was laughing at some of the scenes from this book. And it was all of Tristan's bits, and I was reading it, being like, oh my god, these are the bits that I'm going to get to do, and I'm and I'm just finding them hilarious just on my own here that that was like another thing where I was like if I'm if I'm responding this well to this type of material then you know it just in terms of my portrayal of this character like I think I could be onto a winner here you were naturally drawn to it because it just yeah. fit within your mind's eye yeah uh, absolutely. have you had to play parts where they it wasn't so natural a fit and what did you do to overcome that challenge yeah, I think at drama school, I definitely did. Yeah, you sort of got thrust into in, into all sorts of parts, really. We did like a um, like a restoration comedy, which, you know, I'd, I'd never really even heard of that before I'd, I'd gone to Lambda. So I really sort of struggled with that as a, as a style of writing and as a style of character. But yeah, you've just got to throw yourself into it. I mean, you know, it might not necessarily be what I want to do in my career is to, you know, do restoration play after restoration play after restoration play. But it's good that I've done one and experienced it. Yeah, it's probably... Probably not really something I would necessarily like strive to go and do again a restoration play but I'm really really glad that I've done one because now I know that maybe it's not necessarily for me or um, if it is ever offered to you uh, and you decide you want to do it you know you can yeah because I have done it and actually this one is different to the last one because this one speaks to me a little bit more or, or, or whatever yeah yeah, sure. Totally. Well, of course, because as you go along in a career, things are going to come to you in one way, shape or form. And sometimes yeah. it's to your advantage to take a part, even if you're uh, not sure it's the exact right thing. It's, yeah, totally. especially stage work, which is going to be short term, no matter what you do. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. When you begin a part, when you get a script, and obviously you're going to read, that's the first thing you're going to do. What do you then do? Now, you've already said you tend not to break them down with lots of writing. Some actors have voluminous notes. Anthony Hopkins yep. is famous for voluminous notes and reading a script a hundred times before he's ready to go. What is your preparation on that script? What do you go through? What do you start to think about as you're reading that part? Yeah, I definitely read the scripts. Uh, yeah, like over yeah, a hundred times as well. Maybe like yeah, the notes, the notes thing, not as much, but the reading, reading the entire thing, um, definitely. I really love to sort of link up like music. I like to sort of like decide like what what my character's favorite song would be, type of thing, and then like have, like have like what, you know what would he get home and listen to, or you know if he was if he was going to do this type of thing, what would he what would he listen to on 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 that thing, and sort of try and like maybe structure a day in terms of like the type of songs he would listen to almost like, and it's very sort of cinematic really, you know, when you see 
montage sequences and films with like a song over it. I sort of try and imagine that, that and what song would be playing over the character's day and that type of thing. So you're looking, that's the light, the character's inner life. You're looking to figure out what the inner life is. Yeah, yeah, but through like through songs, yeah. I remember for the cold the cold feet one, the I learned the lines and I and I did some really solid character work on that and I was really happy about it. I remember there was sort of something I was like there was something missing there. And I remember two days before the audition, I basically just listened to Taylor Swift's latest album at the time, like five times. And I was just like, Yeah, he, this guy just loves Taylor Swift. And I was just like listening to I listened to her, her song like the entire way on the tube like leading up to the audition and I went in and I just felt so in character like for, for the, like so the, the music is a massive help for me definitely and not just like even like instrumentals for things you know like sort of soundtracks and things like that does it help you establish an internal rhythm with that character yeah definitely yeah especially when you're working with different accents right well sure which I which I sort of mostly have for my career really certainly have you done an American accent Raven's Hollow was, oh, yeah. Oh, of Raven, course, Raven. naturally. Yeah, Raven's Hollow was. Yeah, I, that's the only one. I, that's, I love that movie. I thought it was terrific. And yeah, of course you had an American accent in that. I don't know what it is about both the Brits and the Australians, but both are great at doing American accents. Yeah. Americans doing British accents, nah, sometimes people have it, but most of the time sometimes, not so great. Yeah, Gillian, but, Gillian Anderson can and do it can't she she's good she really good yeah. well but she's sort of be, she, i think she's she moved great. yeah yeah i think she you're right. lived in england for a long time and i think that's she right. sort of just absorbed it yeah it, that's right yeah yeah it wasn't so much put on as she became it yes yeah. <laughs> um as a regular on a tv series which is different than doing a raven's hollow which is a one-off but as a regular on a tv series once you have started in on that show and you have defined and figured out for yourself who and what that character is about. Is there anything that you do to maintain those thoughts about the character over months or years as you're working on it? Is there a, a, something that you do to keep it present for you? Um, yeah, I mean, again, like sometimes I like to sort of watch maybe the first series back or the second series back if we're going if we're going again. But there is certain little things that I do, you know, like. Um, just sort of, sort of tiny little traditions. Like I've been sort of lucky enough to be in, I, none of them in this room, but given sort of little trinkets of characters over the years. And, you know, I'll maybe like flip around with like Tristan's lighter or Leslie Durrell's police notebook or things like that. But I, I've, I've got to say every single time I've come back for like another series of something, the week before it has been, I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to play him again. I've I've lost him. I've lost him. I've lost him. I don't know what I'm going to do. Wow. Like right up until the point of filming. And then the shout action, I open my mouth, Tristan comes out, they shout cut and I'm like, oh God, there he is. Thank God for that. <laughs> Thank God he showed up last minute. Like it's, it's happened every time. So I'm just going to keep on praying that it, that it, that it keeps on happening. But like, the, you know, the, I've, I've tried to combat it, but there's always, there really is always like a sense of, I don't, I can't remember how I did it. I can't remember how I did it. And wow, then it, that must be nerve wracking. It is terrifying. Yeah, it's absolutely terrifying. But it always it has always come back. So touch wood. That, that's interesting. And so it's you go right bump right up against action before yeah. the character comes back. I've like learned the lines, but I'm like, I don't know if Tristan would have said it like this last series. And I know for a fact, um, Nick in All Creatures, and uh, like he's he's told me he's felt like that before. So I know I'm not alone in that. That's fascinating. It would be weird if you go. No, I can't do this anymore. But you're yeah. always <laughs> you're always going to come through. I think. I think your mental acuity for it is going to just step back in. So you've come to the set and you're in front of a camera and you're really having these doubts. Is there anything that you do prior to them rolling and calling action to prepare for that moment? That is to say, is there any special performance preparation that you have? In terms of like, are you sort of specifically asking like on the day when you're when you're there on set? Sure, especially yeah. on the day, but it could also be the days leading yeah. up too. But in terms of like on on the day on the set, you know, I know this. I'm sure this is such a cliche and like obvious answer to say, but there really is nothing like getting into costume as as your character, especially you know, for the jobs that I've done that have been set in the 1930s. So it's a completely different, you know, you, you, you're, you're stepping back, you know, a hundred, nearly a hundred years in time to a completely different set of clothes, a different hairstyle, you know, you need to be clean shaven. 
you, you know, you, that whole ritual of like tying your shoe, tying these types of shoes that Tristan would wear, putting, doing his tie in the knot that they would have done in the 1930s, you know, putting on his Fair Isle sweater, then looking at myself in the mirror and being like, yeah, that's Tristan. That really is such a huge one. And I know that like there's been some big actors over the years who said, you know, well, you don't Lawrence Olivier for yeah. one, who yeah. said once he put the makeup and the costume and the hair on, he was in character. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and there's definitely a big aspect of that for me. Yeah. So you're more of an external becomes internal actor versus the internal actor becomes external. I think so, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. You need to put the bits on you and that then triggers what you need to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, like, on, on, on the first days of things, yeah, yeah, like, coming back. I think that's great. And, by the way, I think that's, to me, that is the true definition of being an actor, is that you're acting. You're, it's not you, not really. Yes. Although there's a lot to be said for people like Daniel Day-Lewis, who are, is completely internal out, uh, although I'm sure once he puts Mr. Lincoln's makeup on he really feels like mr lincoln um, I, yeah. but then he stays in character do you stay in character as well or no i don't know what you say about daniel day lewis like i think he's a staggering actor like his performances i've seen have just been some of the best i've ever seen in my entire life but i could say the exact same about leonardo dicaprio and he he doesn't do all of that of course of course but, everybody's approach is a little bit different yeah absolutely but i'm not yeah i just don't think that there is like if, if that's the way you do it, then you're the better actor because well, that performance is just as good as that one. And yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't implying that we're talking about better or worse. I'm talking about yeah, how, course, how yeah. do you do it? And mm. yes, there's multiple ways to come at it. And the question yeah. in this particular interview with you is how do you do it? You know? Yes. And, and so I think it's very interesting that you are successful doing it the way you do it. And if you weren't successful at it, obviously they wouldn't hire you again. Yeah, and you need to change change tack type of thing, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, How yeah. important, famously, especially in front of the camera, a little bit less so on stage, but famously relaxation before the camera is important. Yeah. How do you get relaxed before they call action? Um, in series one of the Durrells, I don't think I was relaxed the entire series. Um, you know, I was just, there was obviously imposter syndrome. I'd never been around like that sort of technology, like, you know, the cameras, the big, big cam, big dolly systems, big booms, the lights. Yeah, I think, I, I don't think I relaxed once on series one of the Durrells. I think, honestly, I don't think there's any like tips or advice. I just think the more time you spend on set, the more time you get used to being around that type of, you know that type of thing pretty I much think. like any kind of work the more you do it the more it becomes easier for you to do and more relaxed at it and yeah, I, I imagine that it is it's uh, very intense to get in front of a camera for the first time on a set yeah my oh, man yeah really yeah I remember see, yeah series one of the, of the Durrells was just terrifying and, then, and I think everyone knew it was my first job so they were all being but very very lovely with me and very nice it was Steve Barron uh who who, who, sort of, who directed the first episode and sort of in many ways I'm sure helped me get cast in that role um but he's you know he's like Mr 80 in terms of all these music videos so he's like an absolute legend in in the industry and was just very 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 patient with me which you know I'll always be always be grateful to him for that sure sure I uh, and it it's great to have a champion in your corner somebody yeah, who, who recognizes your abilities and and allows the world to let that come out. What is your your regimen for keeping in physical shape? Are you an exercise person? Do you go to the gym? What do you do? I am, yeah. Um, I think for many years I was just sort of exercising because I thought it's what I should be doing. Whereas now I'm just sort of doing it like, like, like I'm not like I'm not. I've, I've never got in my head. I'm like, right, I want to look like Chris Hemsworth uh, as as Thor. You know, that's that's. I'm just like, no, nah, I just want to sort of be in shape. I want to be able to have a few beers on a weekend with my friends and to not worry about you know the calories or whatever I'm currently in the middle of landscaping my 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 me and my girlfriend have just bought a flat and we're landscaping the garden with uh with a friend of ours and I've been like helping him sort of carry wheelbarrows and mix cement and honestly it, I think it's better than any workout I've ever done at the gym um so now I'm just going to try and sort of help him on certain days do bits of manual labor just to, you know just in my times where I'm like not acting it is such a sort of fun way of one it's like good exercise two like at the end of your day of work you've sort of 
put something together. Um, and it's just a sort of another hobby that isn't that doesn't all like revolve completely around acting and performance and storytelling. You know, it's good to have an interest or a hobby that's completely separate to. Well, and to I presume that. you're you're working muscles that you would not normally work in the gym. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Do you work with your voice every day? Do you do anything to keep your voice up? I like sing, singing really yeah I used I used to for some of the years coming out of drama school trying to do all the sort of vocal warm-ups that they taught us there I don't do that anymore I still do them you know if, I, if I'm if I'm working if I'm like before I go to set I'll warm my voice up on that type of thing before an audition I wouldn't I just I wouldn't do that like day to day I wouldn't do like day to day just like get up and do a, and do a vocal warm-up personally um you're not a singer per se that's not your no, career no, 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 no. But like, I, yeah, I just do it like, yeah, sing along to songs, you know, just to keep, keep the voice warm or whatever, I guess. But yeah, it's not something, it's not, that's not something I'm like. It's not your focus. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, I, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is me trying to rationalize it, but I, I think I rationalize it in a way of that, like, the characters that I'll be playing, they wouldn't be warming their voice up every day type of thing. So, <laughs> so maybe <laughs> maybe that's me cheating and trying to get away with it. <laughs> are, are you are you a good enough singer that you might want to be in musical someday? Um, no, I don't think I am. I, th I think I always used to say that um, I couldn't sing, which got bullied, which, well, <laughs> that didn't get bullied out of me. Sorry, got, that got like a very rightfully sort of taught out of me at Lambda. I can sing. I can sing, but it is, you know, it's not, it's not like a sort of tenor. It's not like, you know, the, the nicest, like a sort of double bass, very deep singing voice. So I think I always had like thoughts of being in, there's this musical called Oh, What a Lovely War. And it's all just like, you know, guys who you, who you'd see in like the working men's social on a Friday night, they're just, they're all on the front line and they'll, they'll bash out a song and it, and it, and, and, and it's not necessarily the best voice you've ever heard, but it's just because it's some lad who's been sent away to war and, I really love the idea of doing a musical like that, but you know, I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not like a good enough singer that I could like carry something like Dear Evan Hansen or something. Or like... <laughs> well, you know, there was this fellow named Rex Harrison, and he was uh, not exactly I mean, one of my favorites. One of my favorites. Yeah. Not really a great singer, but my goodness, he was as famous as could be for doing a musical. Well, that and... was my that, that was my audition song for Lambda is um, on the street where you live. That's oh, what well, that's, that's... there you go. I have to assume that you're a pretty decent memorizer of lines. You've memorized lots of lines in your life. Do you have a technique or a trick or a tip as to how you remember lines or memorize things? Just read, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. Um, and then like read it so many times and then just, and then just start going through it like line by line um, and really memorizing the lines. And then the one that, the one that I used to forget, which I make sure I do uh, now is the final piece of the puzzle is to make sure you know your cue lines. Like you don't need to memorize the other person's lines, but know, know what the last thing that they say is. So you're not just sort of like waiting for like too long of a pause. And then you're like, oh, well, it must be my line now. Then you like, you, you, you know, you know, when, you know, when your impetus is like is to come in. I think I used to skip that one a lot and I just used to learn the lines, but actually I think learning your cue line is, is almost just as important. So the trick, I gather, because I've done a little acting in my life, but it's been a very long time. But most of the actors that I talk to, the real trick is to have it down so cold that it becomes second nature. Yeah. But at the same time, you then have to deliver it as if you're doing it for the first time. Yeah. And <laughs> do you talk your way through that? How do you make that transition from, I know exactly what's coming at me and I know what I have to say, but I have to deliver it in a way that's completely natural as if I'm hearing it for the first time. Is there anything that you do in your head to make that happen? Just try and clear the head in a way, which is, which sounds sort of counter counterproductive because you're trying to remember these lines, but you, yeah, just try and get any sort of form of like uh, anticipation sort of out maybe. Another, very quickly, just going back, another thing that I, I sometimes do, if it's like a sort of big, I, I actually had an audition for a for Picard, the Star Trek Picard thing. Sure, sure. And obviously the dialogue was just, I, I was, it was so hard to learn. It was like, oh, you know, quantum and retro blasters and all like it was so <laughs> hard to learn. And I managed to get it. I managed to get it down and a technique that I got taught ages ago, I think it was at drama school, is to get like a sort of brush or like a broom and hold it in the palm of your hand and try and balance it just on the palm of your hand, keep it sort of balanced as you're doing the lines because you're going to be focused mainly on keeping that broom up 
But if in the back of your head you can keep every single one of those lines going, then you know them. Yeah, if you can be totally distracted and still know yeah, your lines. You can get all the lines out, yeah. You've got all the lines out. Well, speaking of distraction, sets, stages, studios, but particularly sets and stages yeah. tend to be notoriously distracting places. There's a yeah. lot going on. There's a lot of activity, people moving around, a lot of hubbub. Yeah. Do you have any particular way that you – keep those distractions at bay to keep yourself in the moment. Is there anything you do? I'm not the biggest fan of like staying on set while things are getting like getting changed or happening or whatever. I, I, I would like to sort of leave and sort of go to a quiet, you know, and just starting to sort of like be like chill for a second rather than have like all the sort of cacophony around me. But in terms of like, yeah, when you are in the middle of this scene and something happens, I don't know. I think... Uh, Again, I think it's one of them things where it's like you've just got to get through it. And it, and if you don't, and if it does throw you, and if you do need to start again, then luckily with screen, you can just start again. You can oh, well, sit. that's the beauty part of yeah, cameras. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but usually, if I'm honest, I usually just try and ride out a distraction. And if and if it does catch me, I just go, oh, sorry, guys, can we start again? <laughs> the, the only time where you'll really run into a problem with that is when you have a director who doesn't like to do multiple takes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then you better be on your game, really on your game. I've never really had that, luckily, so far. Well, then, yeah. then someday, well, maybe not, because I think he's coming to the last movie he's ever going to make. But if you were to ever work with Clint Eastwood, he would, oh, right. you know, he's like one, two takes tops, and you're moving on to the next thing. So you better have it or you're done. <laughs> wow. I sort of love that in a way, really. So you've worked for lots of different directors, obviously not Clint Eastwood. Mm. And I'm wondering, has any director ever given you a great direction that you've then taken forward in your life and career? I remember a teacher at Lambda had a, an amazing piece of, it wasn't, it wasn't so much as like direction or it was just like a, a really cool quote where it said, there is no, he said, there is no greater special effect in cinema than the human eye when the mind behind it is being changed. So if you can really, you know, connect with like what you're looking at and really get it through in your eyes that you're like processing this information and thinking about, you know, you're changing your mind or you're thinking of what to say, stuff is going to be going on in those eyes. And that's like such an amazing, you know, rather than doing like all this big, you know, like, I don't know, big sort of uh, acting, you know, just really that type of thing is, is really interesting to watch. So what's going on in the soul, I guess? Yeah, yeah. And you're just sort of got these two little windows to try and glimpse whatever it or of it you can. Well, you can't hide that from the camera, can you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially if it's like right up up there, you know, in your grill. Yeah. There's all those phrases about, you know, it's the eyes are the window of, the, of your soul yeah. and that the camera <laughs> sees into that window. And yeah, there's truth to that. The camera reveals all and you really can't hide what you're feeling. So the key then, I guess, is to feel something. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what do you do on days when perhaps you don't feel great or don't feel like you're in it? How do you overcome that? What do you do? Luckily, I've been blessed to work with some incredible actors. Um, and I remember an Ian McKellen quote that says that said, you're only as good as the actor that you're acting opposite. Mm -hmm. And I've had the best co-stars in the world. Uh, and I think it's a big part of the reason why I've, I look so good because they're so good. Also, the other thing, you know, on days, you know, like like a certain emotional days or whatever. If it's if it calls in the script, Tristan cries on this line, and like the the, the expectation is there for you to get there, and it's and, and like maybe you're not feeling that impetus. You know, you can you can get like a little tear stick, which makes your eyes start to water, and then that impulse sets off something inside you. It's it's almost like giving like a car engine like a sort of kick start. You know, like. You push it up a bit and then the engine starts you know you give you give the little bit of like tear stick they start to water and then all of a sudden i'm an emotional wreck like that's just the little spark that i needed um and then i can run with it type of thing so i used to sort of be like slightly embarrassed about asking for things like that and i'm really not anymore <laughs> you're the second actor in this series over all these years that i've been doing it who has talked about tear sticks and Think why why not? Everything that you're doing in front of a camera or on a stage is not real. Yeah. You're trying yeah. to simulate reality and you might actually do things that are ultimately real, but you're making something that's fake seem real. Yeah. So why not? 
Exactly. Yeah, I remember like someone saying to me once, like, "Oh, if you can't if you can't cry on demand, then that means you're not a good actor." And I was like, "Well, can you have a nosebleed on demand? Like, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you're a rubbish actor." Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Go ahead, go ahead and have your average nosebleed on demand. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just bleed, you know, we're going to shoot you and yeah, just go yeah. ahead and bleed on demand. <laughs> yeah, you just do it, yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you read in scripts that screenwriters can do to make your life easier that they're not currently doing? Anything that you've read in a script and said, I wish they would just do X, Y, or Z. I don't love it when they're sort of um, in like the stage directions, right? You know, he, he breaks down in tears. It's like, well, what if I don't want to break down in tears? Like, what if it's more of an insular reaction or what if it's you know like what if what if the reaction i have is just different to that you know it's it's quite I, I mean i know i understand why they have to write things like that because the story needs to go a certain way but it's sometimes quite like prescriptive where it's like and then he breaks down and sobs it's like oh okay <laughs> i'm so glad uh, to hear you say this because i've been a teacher of screenwriting for many years and one of the things that we teach our students is don't tell the actors how to act yeah yeah you know, because if you do, the actors will tend to just remove that and do what comes naturally in that moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All, and, all they'll try and force for something that is just not real. I mean, and yeah, as we were saying earlier, none of it's real, but you, you can really see through it type of thing. Well, so many actors will go through their script and immediately just scratch out all of this, the yeah. directions. Yeah. And so what is the point in putting it in? unless you're in a scene where a, a character is saying something that is not intended to come out the way they're saying that it's being written. Yeah. So then you need to give some clue to the actor about what the intention of the moment is. But generally speaking, telling actors how to act is not a good thing. And I'm glad to hear you say that because you're basically agreeing with that. Yeah, premise. absolutely. absolutely. So, do you do anything now differently when working on a set that you didn't do in the beginning and it's now you say this is the way to do this when i started i did it that way i now do things this way and this is better yeah i think i like to now know a bit more about what's going on around me in terms of like at, at the beginning i think at the beginning i don't know if it was because i was just too nervous or shy but i just wouldn't say anything to anyone whereas now you know i'm i'm just in i'm I think it's just because I'm really interested. I'm I'm interested in all the sort of facets of it. So I'm over at the camera crew and I'm saying, oh, so what size lens have you got on? And how are you lighting it? And, you know, I'm, how come you bought this boot? Or like, why do you put two mics over here? Is that to get the line when she turns to the wall? And, you know, just just all aspects. I like to know what's going on in the room, where it's like, and like every department, what every department has got going on in that room. Whereas, um, yeah, back in series one of the Durrells, I'd like, you know, sure, where do you want me to stand? Okay, I'll say my line here. And then, <laughs> you know, it was that type of thing. You were totally green in those days. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah, massive imposter syndrome. Yeah, terrified. But now I'm just like more, com obviously more confident on set and just really interested in everything that's going on around me and just have a genuine interest to find out about it. I think most people that are writers, directors and actors have a tendency to feel like somebody's going to catch the fact that they're not really good at this. Yeah. And that <laughs> yeah. imposter syndrome comes through. I know I've had it throughout my yeah. career and you may have it again when you go and t take on a script that you don't know what you're doing again and you yeah. may go, well, I don't belong here. Right. But, yeah. but the truth is everybody's going through that. So uh, you're as good as they get. So why not? <laughs> That's, Absolutely. I have been having the most marvelous conversation with Callum Woodhouse today. And I'm just wondering, in all of your experiences up till now, you've met lots of people in the industry, you've had lots of uh, chances to work on various things. Do you happen to have a, a story that may be weird, quirky, offbeat, oddball, or just plain funny? Yeah, funnily enough, I have met some incredible people over my career. But one of my one story that really jumps out to me is uh, this was before I even started drama school. Um, me and my friend were going up from the north of England auditioning for, you know, we'd, we'd book two nights in like the worst, most disgusting hostel you've ever seen because we didn't have any money. Um, and we'd go to these like drama school auditions and on a night off, we'd go to see the theatre so that the next day for our drama school audition, we felt really inspired and pumped up and ready to act from the amazing theatre we'd seen the night before. And one of the ones we went and saw was play at the National with um, an actor called Simon Russell Beale, who's in he was in a film called Death of Stalin, been in, in a big theatre actor. He's done some really cool screen things as well. And we saw him 
we saw him in, on on stage while we were auditioning. Waited for him at the stage door, and he came out and just gave us so much of his time. Me and my friend, he was just chatting to us all night and was asking about how our, you know, where we were auditioning and blah blah, blah and everything and how it's going. Wished us luck, um, and then he, you know, he sort of part, parted ways or whatever. About a month later, I um, I was in London. I'd been accepted into Lambda by this point, and I was in London with my mother, and we were going to uh, a housing sort of fair to try and look at properties to for me to stay. And uh, again, I but we booked tickets to see a play at the at the National, and I was um, I was walking to get the pick up the tickets from the box office, and as I was walking the National, they have like a, a cafe just at the side when you're walking in. I sort of glanced over and I looked and there was Simon Russell Beale sat down with this like folder having a cup of coffee and I was sort of staring at him and he looked up at me and then I looked back down at his script. Then he looked up and did like a sort of double take as if he sort of half recognised me and then went back to his script, um, uh, went back to his folder that he was reading. So I went in, got the tickets, I went went and found my mum and I was like, that actor that I spoke to the other month was there, he's, he's, he's having a coffee, he was the one who was like asking me about my drama school auditions and stuff. And she was like, go over and speak to him. And I was like, no, 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 I can't, I can't. I'm not going over to speak to him, I can't. And she was like, if you don't go over and speak to him, you, you're going to regret it. I was like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. So I sort of, sort of slowly, sort of very shyly walked over to him. I said, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Beale, Mr. Mr. Sam Russell Beale. And he looked up and he went, it's Callum, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> I, went, I went, yeah, yeah, it's Callum. And he was like, yeah, you were auditioning for drama school about a month ago, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I was, I was. And he said, how's it all going? And I said, I've been accepted into Lambda. I'm going, I'm starting Lambda in a couple of months. And he was like, that's incredible. Well done. Congratulations. It's an amazing school. So I've had a really, really lovely chat for like 20 minutes. And he was, he was just being so, so lovely. And I said, right, well, you know, I won't take up too much of your time. I just uh, remembered that chat we had and you were, it was a very inspiring chat. And I wanted to come over and, and just say hi, basically. And thank you. And he was like, oh, no, no worries. No worries. Um, have you got somewhere you need to be? And I was like, no, no, I'm just going to sort of wander around London until we until we have our show. And he was like, oh, you couldn't do me a favour, could you? I'm just trying to learn these lines for my next play here. And they're, they're re I'm really struggling getting them going in. Would you just sit and run them, run, run my lines with me for a bit? And I literally just sat down with this actor who I admired so much. And I just ran lines with him for 30 minutes and just read, read, read his scenes with him. And it was just one of the most valuable experiences, I think, I've ever had and like he, that man is just a beautiful beautiful man that is uh, spectacular yeah well i i hope that you're able to pay that forward someday and do that for I, some up-and-coming young actor uh that's just really a terrific story and gives one heart that you know it's the community of artists and hopefully they continue to support one another in that way i think that's fantastic yeah yeah uh, Last question for you today, Callum. You've already given us lots of great things to chew on and lots of great thoughts and, and um, bits and pieces of advice, but do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you like to give to those who are starting out in the business or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to that next level? Yeah, I think, and, and, and honestly, like, you know, this is like sort of, I don't know. I don't know what the the right phrase would be. I, I, I want to say a pot calling the kettle black because I don't know if I've figured it, figured it out yet. If, if I'm honest, but <laughs> I think something I've figured out recently is you know, one hundred percent of your sole focus can't be acting and and the work because there are going to be times when the phone isn't ringing and you are going to be out of work. And if that's your, if this is all that your focus is, then that basically just means you're signing yourself up to be absolutely miserable for six months or however long you're going to be out of work. So if you can just get any other interests, hobbies, and as far away from performance as it can be, you know, like I was talking earlier about like manual labor, like gardening, you know, going rock climbing, going, I don't know, anything else that, you know, you know brings you joy, brings you contentment. So it's not all geared towards the acting. And then when that doesn't happen, that happen, okay, so I'm miserable then because it isn't happening. Like, no, what about if there's other stuff that, that I can get enjoyment from type of thing. I think that's something that I've sort of been realizing over the last couple of years um, to just not, it, it, it just can't be the be all and end all. It can't be, it can't be everything. Cause then it's just, you know. I'm very, very glad that you said that too, because uh, the truth is when you're in the arts, it's easy to fall down the rabbit hole of being just in the arts. Yeah. And the thing that feeds what makes everybody a great artist is everything else in life. 
it's the nourishment yeah. for what you do as an artist. So the life experiences that you can then bring to your, exactly. Your so a wide expanse of experience is a much better thing than a very narrow expanse of experience. And you may learn it in a conservatory like Lambda, where you're forced to really focus on that art for a while. But at the same time, you need to go out and have a life because the life will enrich the art. That is, yeah, that is perfect. Yeah, that's what I think I was trying to get to say, but I was, I was rambling. <laughs> uh, well, I'm so glad that you said it because I think yeah. it's an absolute fundamental truth about being in the arts entirely and that sometimes artists get lost you know mm -hmm. that old phrase about being lost in the forest for the trees and that's what happens if you're too narrowly focused so uh, i think that's a fantastic bit of advice callum woodhouse this has been a really fantastic uh story so today much. and i can't thank you enough for joining me on the show it's been a lot of fun to talk to you thank you so much for having me Steve. i've loved it yeah it's been amazing thank you and so we've come to the end of today's story beat if you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.